Would you take your Bibles tonight, open please to the book of Romans as we continue our study in the book of Romans. And we are going to talk tonight from Romans 14. Did you find Romans 14? We begin a new chapter, Romans 14, and we're going to look at uh, Lord willing. And if you listen fast enough, we're going to cover the first 12 verses of Romans 14 tonight. Now, what's the issue that Paul is going to address here in this chapter? Uh, the, the, the issue that Paul deals with here is the issue that's a very important issue in the church. He's going to discuss the unity of the believer, the unity of the body of Christ. You know, the church at Rome was a melting pot. And uh, it was, uh, and by the way, that's the way the church should be, should it not? Within the church, it doesn't matter uh, where you are. In, in, in society, what your background is, what country you're from, what your race is, what your so, so, social status is, all believers are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that beautiful oneness and equality uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church really ought to be that way because that's the way it's going to be in heaven. The Bible says when we get to heaven, there's going to be people there from every tribe and nation and kindred and so on. And so heaven will be a melting pot of people from all over. And that's the way it was in the church at Rome. Uh, at the church at Rome, and, and, and again, it's the way it is in the church in America today, you have people that are from all different levels of life. You have both phys uh, people fr um, different from the uh, physical aspect and the spiritual aspect. You have young people and old. You have people who have been saved for 50 years. You have people that have been saved for a relatively short period of time. And then also you have people that come from various backgrounds. You have people that come from uh, that were saved out of an irreligious background, perhaps an atheistic background uh, or a humanistic background. And then you have people that might be saved out of a religious background, people that were Roman Catholics and came to know the Lord Jesus, people that may have one, at one time been a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness, and they came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that diversity of backgrounds and, and different places where people come from to be saved and put in the body of Christ is actually a wonderful thing. Diversity is a wonderful thing. But also, if we're not careful, it tends to bring about clashes. Uh, it, it, it can, if we're not careful, bring about conflict in the church. Because everyone from their particular vantage point, from their particular place in life, when they get saved and they come into the church, they kind of bring in their own viewpoints. They kind of bring in their own preferences, their own experiences of life. And what you'll find out is that we don't all agree with each other on certain things. I don't think anyone in here agrees with me 100% on everything, and that means all of you are wrong. That's what I'm trying to do, get you to agree. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we all have different uh, viewpoints about certain things, uh, different backgrounds, different preferences, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a different preference with reference to certain things. We have to dis, uh, distinguish between the differences between biblical convictions, personal convictions, and preferences. A biblical con conviction is a God-given belief or duty that God requires of all of us because it's made very clear in the Scripture. A preference is a matter of personal taste that a person might have based on past experience. Some people might have a preference with reference to music or the style of worship or with reference to dress and so on. But it's a matter of personal taste based on uh, past experience. And then there may be, we could say, personal conviction. This might be something that a person may feel strongly about in their own Christian life. And for them, they've been personally convicted about this certain issue or thing. But it's not, not something they can necessarily share with someone else or demand of someone else. Because really, it's a personal conviction. And the church is made up of people that have all of those things. Obviously, all of us have biblical convictions that we share, that you're, we're united around, but we may be different on the areas of preferences, and we may be different on the areas of personal conviction. Well, I think this is part of the problem that Paul is dealing with here in the church at Rome. Again, the church at Rome was a melting pot, people that came from various backgrounds, various situations, who felt strongly about different issues, and Paul didn't want those issues to cause division in the church. Because one thing is for sure, and here's the greatest conviction that all of us should have in the church, and that is we love one another. Amen? I didn't hear a really good amen after that. I'm going to try that over again. We should all love one another. Amen? amen. 
Okay, you guys scared me there for a minute. Don't make me come down off this pulpit. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We, we love one another. And that is our strongest conviction. And this love that we have should bind us all together despite the little preferences, the little differences that we may uh, have in the church. Uh, what did Paul say about this matter of unity? In Ephesians 4, 3, he said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Notice he said, he didn't say endeavoring to get the unity of the Spirit because that, beloved, is already a byproduct of being in Christ. You understand that? When you're saved, God already gives us unity. We are all united around one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. We have all this oneness in the body of Christ. So that unity is automatic. We don't have to get it. But I do want to tell you, we have to keep it. We have to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, the Bible says, which is the bond of um, peace. And so... Uh, Paul is concerned about this in the church at Rome because the church at Rome was made up of Jews saved out of a a Judaistic background, and it was made of Gentiles saved out of a pagan background. And they each brought into the Christian life their particular pre-understandings or presuppositions or things that they uh, had in their own Christian life. In fact, what the Apostle Paul does is he divides them into two groups. He calls them the weak and the strong. He says there are weak believers in the church and there are the strong. Now, what are the definitions here? What did he mean by the weak and the strong? Well, first, the strong, the way he defined the strong, if you look at it carefully, he defined these as kind of believers who understood their liberty in Christ. They felt their liberty in Christ. They understood that what freedom in Christ meant. And that meant that they didn't cling to meaningless traditions or they didn't cling to forms of religion. They understood fully their freedom. They knew that they were free from sin, free from death, free from hell, free from Satan. They understood that they were not obligated to follow holy days and ceremonies. They were free from all of that. They knew that they were free to make choices, dependent upon how the Spirit of God might have moved in their heart individually. They were people that knew the word of God. Their conscience was fully informed by the scripture. They were mature and they understood what they could do and what they couldn't do. They understood this area of freedom. Well, what about the weak? Well, the weak, the way Paul defined the weak, are these are individuals that continue to hang on to some of the things perhaps in their old life, like for instance, for instance, with the Jews, their rituals or their ceremonies, they had trouble letting go of some of those things. Uh, they didn't believe they had freedom in Christ to do certain things. And so they were limited in their freedom. They saw that kind of freedom as a threat. And they preferred, rather than to exercise freedom, they preferred to remain as they were. They didn't want to, uh, to test the water, so to speak. And they didn't want to exercise that freedom to do certain things because it went against their conscience. And again, this might be dependent upon the background in which they were saved out of. And so there was these two groups then in the church. And there was was the tendency for the strong to look down upon the weak as being legalistic, as being hypersensitive, as being someone that really needed to grow. And someone who didn't know how to enjoy their freedom in Christ because they seemed to be bound up with all of these little, little sensitive issues in their life that they felt like they couldn't exercise freedom in. And so there was this tendency then for the strong to look down upon the weak. But then there was also the tendency for the weak to condemn the strong. For a weak believer to look at a believer who was strong, who exercised their liberty and think that they were perhaps sinning against God by doing certain things. And they were judging them. They were condemning them because here was a brother that was exercising their liberty in Christ. And so this was going on at the church at Rome. And this was a potential problem because it was bringing division in the church. And of course, that's always a threat. And Paul wants to deal with this issue here and he, in Romans chapter 14 with respect to this this weaker and stronger brother. Now, we understand that in the New Covenant, we are free from all the Old Testament ceremonial laws. We're free from, this, from, the, from the civil laws, the ceremonial laws. Of course, we're not free from the moral laws of the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments still apply to us. But the ceremonial laws and the rituals uh, 
that were given to Israel for a certain time, for a certain period of time, a certain uh, people, the Israelites, are not something that we have to follow or we have to obey. And so the Church of Rome was made up with Jews that came out of that Judaistic background. And for many of them, they couldn't let go of some of those ceremonies. Uh, they couldn't let go of some of those traditions. For example, uh, they these ingrained traditions included things like observing certain dietary laws and feast days and new moons and Sabbaths. The New Testament seems to indicate that many of the Jews that were saved were still bound to the Mosaic law. law. Their conscience seemed to be bound by these unnecessary things, and their liberty in Christ was uh, hindered because of that. And then you also had in the church Gentiles who were saved out of a pagan background. And part of their background was these mystery pagan religions, which included eating meat that was sacrificed to idols because the uh, Gentiles believed that certain de uh, uh, demonic spirits could inhabit a animal and thereby inhabit the meat. And so they had to have that meat blessed and cleansed by their God, which was a false God. And so all these pagan rituals were included in the cleansing of the meat before a person could eat the meat. And if you were a Gentile saved out of that pagan background, there would be the tendency on your part to avoid buying meat or getting meat from any of those places that sold that meat that was so-called cleansed in that day. And so you had these two groups in the church. And within the Jews and the Gentiles, you had the stronger believers that exercised their liberty, and you had the weaker believers that still were very sensitive to some of these issues. And this is what Paul writes to settle, because the legalistic believers were looking down on the stronger believers, we could say, and vice versa was happening in the church. And what Paul is writing the church to say is, look, we need to receive one another. We need to understand that there's going to be little differences in these areas that should not hinder us from loving and receiving one another in Christ. Don't let these things become an issue where it divides you from fellowship with another brother. So what we're going to see here are four reasons why Paul says we need to receive one another in Christ. No matter what a person's background might be, what they're saved out of, what their particular preference might be right now, or their personal conviction, or something that is on their conscience, we need to receive one another without judging another believer. So look in chapter 14, look in verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. That is, receive them, not for the purpose of passing judgment on them. You need to fully receive a brother and don't bring judgment to them. Because they might differ from you in some of these things. Receive them. That's the exhortation of Paul. And let me give you the, the first reason. God's simple proclamation, because the Lord receives all believers. Who are you to reject someone that God receives? That's the question. If the Lord receives them, why can't you receive them? Look at verse number two. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Again, what are we talking about here? The one who is strong in the faith believes that he has liberty to eat all things. He doesn't have any dietary constraints. He's not bound by the old Mosaic dietary laws. However, there are other believers who are weak, who eat only vegetables. They are, did you know, they, you know vegans are not new. They go all the way back to the church at Rome. Uh, vegetarians, vegans. They only eat herbs, it says, herbs. That's all they eat, just vegetables. And the stronger believer says, I, I have freedom. I can eat whatever I want. And the weaker believer says, no, I'm just going to eat the vegetables. I don't know where that meat came from. It may have been sacrificed to an idol. I don't want to be a bad testimony and that sort of thing. Now, is the strong believer right? Is, can he eat uh, everything? Is he free to eat um, everything? And the answer is, of course, yes, he is. Write down 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 4. And five, listen to this. Every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It's okay to eat meat. It's okay. I think I told you before I'm a member of PETA, pastors eating tasty animals. Some of you are just waking up tonight. I'm glad you're, glad you're awake. He says, look, you're free to eat anything you want. 
Um, and that's what Paul says. It's, uh, there's nothing to be refused. If you receive it with thanksgiving, and if it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer, it's okay. Remember in Acts chapter 10 when Peter fell asleep on the rooftop there in Joppa and God gave him a vision and there came a sheet out of heaven and on the sheet was all manner of creatures, animals. And there was a voice that said, what? Arise, Peter, kill and, and eat. And what did Peter say? Not so, Lord. I have never eaten any unclean thing. And what did the Lord say? What God has cleansed, don't you call unclean. Now, I can't prove, but I think that there was probably on that sheet, probably crabs and crawfish and, and, uh, and pork, uh, pigs and so on. So I would say, you know, it's okay to eat uh, bacon. It's okay to eat barbecue. It's okay to eat crabs here in Baltimore. Amen. All right. Another week. Amen. You guys need to get with it tonight. And the stronger believer says, you know what? We're, we're, we, don't, we don't have any dietary restrictions. We can eat whatever we want. So sometimes I hear believers in a church say, well, we shouldn't eat. If the Old Testament said that the Jews shouldn't eat that, then we shouldn't eat it. There's no such restriction in the New Testament on the believer. The Bible makes it very clear that all things are, are um, cleansed by prayer. And you can, there's nothing that is to be refused. But now that's the stronger believer. The stronger believer says, I can exercise my liberty. I can eat whatever. And the weaker believer comes along and says, wait a minute, I'm just going to eat vegetables. And they ate only vegetables. So I want you to know if you're a vegan tonight, you're weak. <laughs> just kidding. So, but again, they, what, what was the reason for that? It was their conscience. It was because they didn't feel they had the liberty because, again, this might be a Gentile believer that was saved out of that pagan background where they were eating all kind of meats. Uh, of The meats were sacrificed to idols, and it was all part of a pagan worship system, and they no longer wanted anything to do with that. And for that particular believer, it would wound their conscience, their sensitive conscience, for them to partake in eating that meat. And so they decided that they would eat just vegetables. And, and that's what was going on here in the church. And so what was going on? And by the way, this also probably inc included drink because in verse 17, what does Paul say of chapter 14? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So he may have been talking about also ab abstaining from certain kind of drinks and so on. That might have been part of the debate. But that was the issue here. And, and so you have these two groups. But notice what Paul says in verse number three. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God has what? Received him. No matter what category you're in, God's received you. If you're a person that believes, I, I need to abstain from that, and this is my dietary restriction, this is a personal conviction of mine that this is what I am to do, then, okay, God receives that, brother. Why should I reject him? Why should I judge him? Why should I rail things against them? I shouldn't. That's the whole point that Paul's making. And a weaker brother shouldn't judge a stronger brother. If they're exercising their liberty, if they feel liberty of, of conscience and spirit to be able to do certain things, then the weaker brother shouldn't judge them. Because, again, the bottom line is, is that God receives them. God receives them, so we shouldn't receive them. So he says, let not him who eat, eateth not, that's the weaker believer, judge that's crino. Um, and again, because weaker believers had a tendency to judge them. And then he says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And so this was going on to look down on. And Paul said, both of you stop that because here's the bottom line. God has received him. Are we not to receive who God has received? That would be a bad thing. No, we receive them. You may be different in your stance on this than I am. If you want to exercise your liberty to do certain things, then I need to not condemn you for that. And vice versa, you don't need to condemn me because I might have certain restrictions in my life that you don't have. Because this is the way God has operated with me. So we ought to receive one another simply because God receives us. That's what Paul says. But here's the second reason. God's sustaining power. Uh, the Lord sustains all believers. Look at verse number four. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, 
Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him to stand. And again, the strong had the tendency to despise the weak, and the weak the strong, and, and uh, to justify their feelings. A weak brother might say, you know, that brother that's practicing all that liberty, you know what, they're going way too far. They're going way too far over the line. And I'm afraid for that, that brother, that libertarian brother, that they're being too loose in the way they live their Christian life. They're getting too close to the edge. And I'm just afraid that they're going to fall and they're going to destroy their Christian walk because they're practicing, they're abusing their liberty. Not just practicing liberty, they're abusing it. And then the stronger brother would say about the weaker brother, you know, I'm concerned about this weaker brother because uh, this weaker brother is so uh, restricted. They're so legalistic in their approach to the Christian life. And they have all these don'ts and all these little things that they can't practice. And I'm afraid that they're going to get discouraged and they're going to they're going to one day they're going to they're going to get discouraged and quit. They're going to fall away from the faith because they're so bound by all of these restrictions. And Paul says to both of these, Paul says, look, who are you in the first place to render that judgment on another man's servant? You know whose servant you are? You're God's servant. And I'm God's servant. And Paul says, you don't have the right to evaluate someone else's servant. Your opinion doesn't really matter in their life because they have one master and that is the Lord. And what Paul's basically establishing here is that judgment by an outsider, that's irrelevant. Your judgment of that weaker brother or that weaker brother's judgment of a stronger brother, that's, that's not really relevant in this situation. In fact, human judgment is not relevant at all. That's why at one point in Paul's ministry in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul said, I judge not my own self. In other words, he says... Um, that what you think of me is a very small thing, and I don't even judge my own self. What was he saying there? That man's judgment really doesn't matter. There's only one judgment that matters, and who is that? That's God. What you think of me is a very small thing, and the Greek word there is a superlative of the Greek word mikros, where we get the word microscope. He was saying it's a very, very, very small thing, Paul said to the Corinthians, what you think of me, your judgment doesn't really matter. Do you think one day when God's judging us, he's going to come to you and say, hey, what do you think? I'd like to get your opinion on, on, on Jerry. What do you think? He's not going to ask you that. You know why? I hate to tell you, because your judgment doesn't really matter. Human judgment just doesn't matter at all. And that's the point that Paul is making. Paul said, even my own judgment of myself doesn't matter. That's why Paul said, I don't judge myself. And what he meant by that is he didn't mean that we don't evaluate ourselves spiritually because we need to take spiritual evaluation, make sure we're in the faith. Whenever we come to the Lord's Supper, Paul said, judge yourself. He didn't mean that. He meant that when it came to evaluating whether I'm a success or failure before God, my judgment really doesn't matter because I have a tendency to give myself a lot of credit. You heard about the one preacher who thought he preached a good sermon. He went home to his wife and said, uh, no one really said anything about his sermon. He was kind of fishing for a compliment. He said, how many great preachers do you think there are in the world today? And she said, one less than you think. That didn't happen to me, by the way. All right. But really, we had a tendency to give ourselves a, a lot of credit. You know, I might think I'm really doing good when I may not be doing good. I might think that I'm doing really bad when maybe I'm not doing as bad as I think. That's why Paul said, I don't judge my own self. He said this, for I know nothing against myself, yet am I not hereby justified. Paul said, look, I don't know anything in my life that displeases the Lord. I don't know anything in my life that I need to get right, but that doesn't get me off the hook. I'm not justified by that. Why? Because he that judges me is the Lord. Again, human judgment doesn't really matter. That's his whole point. The only judgment that really matters is the judgment of Almighty God. It's what he thinks, not what I think about myself, not what you think about me. It's only what God thinks. That's the only judgment that matters. And so Paul brings it up and he says, who art thou that judges another man's servant? Look at this, to his own master he standeth or faileth. God, the Lord Jesus is my master, and I will stand or fall according to what he thinks not according to what others think. And then he says this. This is a great statement in verse 4. Yea, he shall be holding up, 
for God is able to make him stand. In case you're worried about that weaker brother falling away or that stronger brother going astray, just remember this, that God is the one who makes them to stand. You know what I thank God for? He's the one who keeps me. He keeps me in the way. He keeps me from falling. He's the one that upholds me. It's not my strength, it's his strength. And Paul says, look, I know you, th you say you're worried about that weaker brother, that stronger brother, but just remember this, God's power is the one that upholds them. God will keep them. The Bible affirms that, doesn't it? In many places, Jesus said, no man will be able to pluck them out of my hand. We are secure in Christ, and God is the one who's able to keep us secure and strong. And so Paul says, don't worry about that. Don't worry about them falling away because just receive them. You personally, you receive them because of God's sustaining power. The Lord sustains all believers. So number one, receive them because of God's simple proclamation. The Lord receives all. God's sustaining power. The Lord sustains all. But then he gives a third reason. God's sovereign position. The Lord is sovereign over all. Look at verse 5. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he that giveth, he giveth thanks, of God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of both the, of the dead and of the living. Now, what's Paul's major point in these verses here? His major point is very simple. It's simply this, that even though the practices of both groups, the strong and the weak, might vary, they both have the same motive. Their motives are the same. To the brother who esteems one day above another, and this might be the Jewish believer saved out of Judaism, that ingrained in his religious life is to esteem Sabbath days and some holy days and feast days. That whole system was still so much a part of his life that he has the tendency to esteem those days still high, higher than the rest. And then there are the Gentile believers. They had nothing to do with that system. And so they esteem all days alike. They're all the same to that believer. And so the, to the Jewish believer, he'll still set apart some of those days and worship God. And to the Gentile believer, he will esteem all those days to the same. And he too will worship God. But here's the point. Their motives are the same. Why does the weak believer keep those traditions? Because he believes in his heart that he's pleasing the Lord and he wants to glorify God. Why does that stronger believer exercise his liberty and enjoy the gifts of God? Because in his heart, he believes by doing that, he is giving thanks to God and he is glorifying God. And the point is the motive of both is the same. They're both being spiritual. You know, you can be weak and be unspiritual, or you can be weak and spiritual. You can be strong and be unspiritual, or you can be strong and be spiritual. The idea is, the issue is, are you living under the Lord? And are you doing what you're doing for the glory of God? That's the whole point. He's not saying it's better to be this or that. He's just saying that both of these, they both have the same motive, no matter how they might practice no matter how they may conduct their diets or their days, their overall motive is to glorify God and realize that the Lord is Lord over their whole life. They're Lord over every part of their life. But look what he says at the end of verse 5. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Paul is saying, whatever you do, you ought to, um, you ought to think about what you do and you ought to do it as obeying that conscience. Whatever your conscience tells you, you need to be fully persuaded about it. But here's the point. Don't, don't go against your conscience. Be fully persuaded in your own mind. And if your conscience tells you that this is what you need to do, then that's what you do. You do not, as a believer, want to get into the habit of violating your conscience. That's a dangerous pattern to get into. 
And so if your conscience tells you to do this, if you're fully persuaded, then do that. But don't ignore your conscience because your conscience plays such a vital part in the sanctification process. It's also a deterrent against what? Sin in your life. And if you get in the habit of ignoring your conscience, then you can easily yield to sin and temptation. Don't do that. Your conscience is a barrier against sin. So be persuaded about what you do. Obey your conscience. That's what he's saying. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, and defer to the conscience when you need to, because that's the way you ought to live. And he says, look in verse 8, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, th therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to the Lord no matter what. Here's the main thing. No matter what your position is, make sure you're living under the Lordship of Christ. Make sure that he is Lord, absolutely Lord over all of your life. Manage your conscience accordingly and live to the glory of God. Live under the Lordship of Christ and make sure you're trying to please him because that's really what the Lord wants from all of us, just to completely, totally live and please him. We don't belong to ourselves; We belong to the Lord because look what he says here in verse number nine. For, this, for to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the living and the dead. This is the whole reason why Jesus died for you on the cross, that he might be Lord of your life. And so the question is, uh, is he Lord? That's why he lived. That's why he died. That he might be Lord in your life. And so, friend, is he Lord in your life? That's the question. And then let me give you the fourth reason. Why should we receive one another? Because of God's simple proclamation, the Lord receives all. God's sustaining power, the Lord sustains all. God's sovereign position, the Lord is sovereign over all. But here's the last reason. Because of God's sure promise, the Lord alone will judge all believers. All believers. Look at verse 10. And why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall shall confess to God. Verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And so Paul asks some basic questions. Why do you judge? Why does the weak judge the strong? Why, did, why do you judge your brother? Why did the strong judge the weak? And verse number 10, we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The text literally says God, the judgment seat of God, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it's where it's called the judgment seat of Christ. But those two verses together tell us that Christ is God, right? That's a beautiful affirmation of the deity of Christ. And what he's saying is, in that day, when we all stand before the Lord, you know what's going to happen? God is going to bring to light the hidden things. You know, we think we know each other, but we really don't. And I know that there are believers in here tonight, and you are living under the Lord, and there are things that you do that no one else sees, that no one else notices, but I want to tell you, God sees it. God notices it. And I'm talking about the positive things. I know that there are believers here tonight, and you have given sacrificially to, to another, and you have ministered to others, and you've done all that without any fanfare, without anyone seeing or noticing it, and you haven't, uh, you know, put, put it on Facebook or anything like that. You just did it unto yourself before the Lord. And you know what? One day in the judgment, all those hidden things are going to come to light when the Lord judges and he sees everything. That's what he's saying here. We're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is not to be confused with the great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment recorded in the book of Revelation, that's when God is going to judge those who don't know the Lord. You heard about one deacon in the church who was asked to pray, and he got his judgments mixed up, and he said, Lord, grant that I stand before that great white throne judgment. Well, friend, don't pray that for me. You don't want to stand before the great white throne judgment because that's for those who don't know the Lord. But those who are Christians will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible says, at that time in judgment. He will be the one judging us. And the Bible says, again in verse 11, for it's written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, 
and every tongue shall confess to God. And here he's quoting Isaiah 45, 23. And Paul used a portion of that in the book of Philippians, as we know. But he's pointing to that future judgment when we're going to bow before God and all of us, we will give account of our own self to the Lord. The Bible says at that time, that's when the real judgment is going to happen. So what's Paul telling us? That our attitude in the church is to have open arms and receive one another with love not rendering judgment against another who, because they may differ from you or me on certain issues, certain preferences, certain personal convictions. We are not to let those things divide us or come between us. Those things are, are, are not important as compared to the fact that we are all in the body of Christ. We are all servants of Christ. We all are living for the glory of Christ. We are trying to please him the best way we know how. And the thing that binds us together, even though we may have little differences about little things, the thing that binds us together is that beautiful love that we have in Jesus, that wonderful love. And so we need to just be in the habit of receiving one another, constantly receiving one another, because the Lord receives us, because the Lord will sustain us, because the Lord is sovereign over all, because the Lord is the one that will be the judge of us all. And so that's what we need to practice, this wonderful love. In other words, you know what? Let's just stop the little criticisms. Stop it. That's what Paul's saying to the, to the Romans. Stop that. Again, in verse 1, he that is weak in the faith receives not for the purpose of passing judgment. You know what he's saying? Stop that little, those little criticisms, those little judgments. They're not helping anyone. It's nothing but negative. Stop that. Remember, the Lord receives them, so who are you to reject them? And love one another and receive one another in the faith. May this be the way that we live our life. Let's, let's bow for prayer tonight. Let's bow for prayer. Father, help us to obey what the Apostle Paul is teaching here. Lord, it's wonderful to be in the body of Christ. It's wonderful to have the unity of the Spirit, which is the bond of peace in the body of Christ. And Father, we live in a world today where it's very divided. There are so many things dividing people today. And Lord, if we're not careful, we can allow that divisive spirit to enter into the body of Christ. Lord, may we prevent that. God forbid that that should enter into the body of Christ. But Lord, help us to receive one another in love, knowing that we are all part of that wonderful church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all received by you, loved by you, upheld by you. And so, Lord, may we have that same love towards one another, to receive one another in the faith. Lord, help us to apply these things. Help us to live out these things. And help us, Lord, not just to say it, but to live it, to show it in the way that we act towards one another, in the way that we receive one another with love and open arms. And Lord, if there's, if there's any negativity, I pray that there'll be those that will repent of that and put it away and forsake it. And practice the same thing that Paul has given us here. So, Father, bless these words to our heart. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.